Well, today, on the witness stand, in federal court in Manhattan, E. Jean Carroll had to relive the experience of receiving death threats from Donald Trump supporters while Donald Trump was watching her testify from the defense table in a civil lawsuit that will determine how much money Donald Trump has to pay E. Jean Carroll for his lying about her. As the judge explained to the jury when they were seated yesterday, it has already been proven that Donald Trump did indeed sexually assault E. Jean Carroll in a manner that is considered rape, as the judge said in common parlance. To establish the damages that E. Jean Carroll has suffered and should be compensated for, her lawyers presented on screen for all of the jurors to see a sample of the threats E. Jean Carroll has received. Question, and this, me and this is this message typical of the kind of messages you received threatening you with violence? No. Question, why not? Answer, this is more, it's longer, more descriptive, in an odd way, more eloquent in the way they want me to die. Question, how do they want you to die? Answer, stretched, my neck stretched immediately after a quick public trial. Question, Ms. Carroll, what's the date of this message? This is the day after the trial last year. Question, and how does this person want you to die? Answer, I apologize to the people in the audience because when a woman, particularly a woman, sees the words, we can't help but think of the image. And so he wants me to stick a gun in my mouth and pull the trigger. And I imagine that many of us now can picture that. Donald Trump violated an order given to him directly from the bench today by the judge requiring Donald Trump to not make any comments that the jury can hear. Later, with the jury out of the courtroom, E. Jean Carroll's co-counsel, Sean Crowley, told Judge Lewis Kaplan, quote, the defendant has been making statements that, again, we can hear at the counsel table. Some of the jurors are sitting closer to him than we are. He said it is a witch hunt. It really is a con job. And when you played the last video, he said, it's true. That was a video of Donald Trump lying about E. Jean Carroll. Judge Kaplan said, Mr. Trump has the right to present here. That right can be forfeited, and it can be forfeited if he is disruptive. Then the judge, speaking directly to Defendant Trump, said, Mr. Trump, I hope I don't have to consider excluding you from the trial of or at least from the presence. I understand you're probably very eager for me to do that. Mr. Trump, I would love it. The judge, I know you would. You just can't control yourself in these circumstances, apparently. There are some press reports that Donald Trump muttered, you can't either, but that line does not appear in the official court transcript. Donald Trump is on trial for not being able to control himself when he raped E. Jean Carroll in a department store in Manhattan and not being able to control himself when he lies about E. Jean Carroll. The last thing competent Trump lawyers would want in the courtroom is an exhibition of Donald Trump being unable to control himself. There was a recess immediately after, and immediately after the judge told Donald Trump Immediately after the judge told Donald Trump, you just can't control yourself, then they had a recess. And as soon as the session resumed, one of Trump's co-counsel, Michael Madeo, told the judge, we'd like to make a motion for recusal. There was representation made by Sean Crowley, who was your former law clerk 10 years ago, regarding some of the conduct by President Trump. You immediately accepted her representations. There was no opportunity for the defense to respond. There was no consultation with the defense. She made representations that President Trump was not, not that he can control himself, that he was disruptive. The, the judge said, she did, did she? Mr. Medeo, there, are, there have also been a general hostility toward the defense throughout this case based on all of that and under Ethical Canon 3 will make an application for recusal of the court. The judge denied. Deputy Clerk, shall I get the jury now? The judge, sure. Judge Lewis Kaplan knows every move the Trump lawyers have made and are going to make and rules on their stunts immediately with one word rulings like denied. Later, Trump co-counsel Alina Haba 
moved for a mistrial because E. Jean Carroll testified that she deleted some of the death threats that she received. Attorney Haba, Your Honor, at this moment, I feel I have to ask for a mistrial. The witness has just admitted to deleting evidence herself, which are part of her claim of damages, and I haven't seen them. She has no evidence of them. She hasn't turned them over. The judge denied. The jury had already seen plenty of death threats that E. Jean Carroll did not delete. Attorney Haba insisted that E. Jean Carroll was not suffering because of Donald Trump's attacks on her and that, in fact, she enjoys the attention. Question, at some level, you enjoy this attention? Answer, no. E. Jean Carroll's attorney objects to that question and then the judge overrules the objection and then E. Jean Carroll says, this is not the kind of attention that I enjoy. Question, then why, Ms. Carroll, were you publicizing the lawsuits yourself? Answer, because once I spoke up, E. Jean Carroll continues speaking over her own attorney, attorney's objection. I wanted people to know that a woman can speak up and win a trial. I wanted people to know. It was a major victory, and I wanted people to know. I don't want to be quiet now. I'm 80. It's not right to try to make women be quiet. It's been going on for too long. E. Jean Carroll told the jury that she now lives, quote, in the mountains, in the woods, in a small cabin. She described what Donald Trump has done to her life and the security precautions she has had to take, including her new dog, a pit bull, who is a rescue, who patrols her property inside an electronic fence. E. Jean Carroll described how a simple trip to a grocery store can become terrifying for her. Question. Have there been any instances where you change your behavior because of these security concerns you have? Answer. I change direction a lot while driving. There was also a time at the grocery I had parked in a really safe space. I had gone to the grocery. I had done two weeks worth of shopping. I had the cart filled to the brim. I'm on the way out to my car with the cart. And I see a man leaning against my car like this. He was wearing a brown shirt and brown pants waiting for me. So I backed up with my cart and went back in the grocery and stood behind the wall and watched for him to leave. And as soon as he walked away and I hadn't seen him anyplace else, then I quickly exited the store, got in my car and drove home. When I arrived in the driveway and opened my car door, I discovered that I had left my entire cart of groceries in the grocery store. That's how hyper alert I am. I was way more attentive to my surroundings than I was to the food I had just bought. Her lawyer asked E. Jean Carroll what other security steps she has taken. Answer, I alerted the neighbors to be on the watch and I bought bullets for the gun I had inherited from my father. Question, where do you keep that gun? Answer, by my bed. You know, I said last night that Alina Haba is now the front runner for worst Trump lawyer to appear in court. This is just, uh, and for lawyers, what I'm about to read is absolutely stunning. Uh, this is a, a moment that she has with the judge where she is reading a document in court. The judge says, what exhibit is this, Ms. Haba? Ms. Haba, I'm trying to get it in, Your Honor. I have to ask about it. The judge, guess what? You may not read from a document that's not in evidence. Ms. Haba, sure, let me get it in. The judge, no, we're going to take a break now, during which you should refresh your memory about how it is you get a document into evidence. And uh, Faith Gay, Donald Trump is paying or... Who knows if he's paying? Uh, this is who Donald Trump has chosen to represent him in court. Look, she is having a hard time. Judge Kaplan is a pro. I will say that the judge kept everybody on their toes today. He certainly was all over Ms. Haba, but he was impatient with E. Jean Carroll if she got off track. He certainly sustained a lot of objections with Robbie Kaplan. Um, I think... You know, as far as we can see, he is giving a very fair trial. But the real question is, you know, Donald Trump is not necessarily playing just to these jurors. He wants to broadcast a theme 
that the judge is prejudiced against him. He would love it if the judge throws him out of the courtroom. He wants everyone to realize who's out there watching that he's having to be on trial a second time with E. Jean Carroll for what he will say are the same, same types of things, and that he's been gagged. He's forced to try to murmur in the back of the room to get attention. That will be his narrative of complete unfairness and victimization. And it may well be successful, successful on the outside, but I agree with Andrew. I can't imagine these jurors are taking kindly to these antics. Uh, Senator Baldwin, uh, this was obviously a very moving experience today to listen to these stories from around America of what Donald Trump and the Republican-controlled Supreme Court has done. Without question, Dr. Denard was um, sharing her uh, account, and it just reminds us of the dire reality in a post-Roe America during this briefing, we were reminded by other witnesses um, about uh, the situation across this country. Uh, a doctor from uh, Washington, D.C. talked about a woman who had just accumulated the bus fare she needed to come up from the South to get care. She had no money left for a hotel, stayed at a homeless shelter, and got food from a food pantry. Um, so she could receive the care that she needed. In Wisconsin, uh, we fell back to a law that was passed in 1849, a criminal abortion ban. And those same dire stories have happened across the state of Wisconsin for the 15 months since Dobbs was decided and Roe fell. And now in the state of Wisconsin, we have 69 out of our 72 counties where there is no access available. Let's listen to what Dr. Serena Floyd said today. There is absolutely no need for interference from any government policy, politician, any government interfer interference whatsoever as they are trying to make that decision. In order for us to get to a place where our patients can have the care that they need and feel safe and have good outcomes, it means that we've got to pull the politics out of the exam room. Senator Baldwin, uh, there is no clearer distinction uh, between Joe Biden and Donald Trump or Nikki Haley, for that matter. Uh, the Republican candidates for president are in favor of a national abortion ban enacted by Republicans in the Congress. Without any question, our rights and freedoms are on the ballot this November. And it's not only true at the level of the presidency, although we saw what uh, President Trump did in pushing forward uh, three activist Supreme Court justices and what that resulted in, um, but it's happening in Senate and House races across the country. There's probably no better example than in my home state of Wisconsin, where Washington, D.C. Republicans have recruited a California bank owner, mega millionaire, to run against me. If he wins, he could be very well the uh, deciding vote for a national abortion ban. He has said he is totally opposed to abortion rights. There's no question that these rights and freedoms are on the ballot. I, by contrast, lead the effort to restore Roe versus Wade to our national laws and uh, take the additional step of making sure that states don't pass local laws that interfere with those basic rights. The overwhelming majority of America supports having access to abortion care and also the right to control one's own body. And we can't stop fighting until that is, again, the law of the land. I think it'll be clear to most voters that the issue is on the ballot in the presidential election by the time we get to November. But it's also, of course, on the ballot in Senate elections because it is the United States Senate that confirms the judges who make these kinds of decisions that the Supreme Court has made. You can have a Republican Senate uh, c approving the Republican judges, the kind who are now in the Supreme Court, or you can have a democratically controlled Senate not trying to control, not allowing even a Republican president to get those uh, judges uh, appointed. Absolutely. And, you know, we focus a lot appropriately on Supreme Court 
justices. But every federal judge we appoint and confirm are serving lifelong terms. This is a long time. And as long as they have their pro-life litmus test uh, on the Republican side, it can do damage um, to Americans' rights and freedoms for decades to come. The reason I really wanted to focus on this tonight is that it, it's easy to focus on the really big things in the United States Supreme Court, the abortion uh, issues uh, that come to the court. But this is the kind of day to day way in which the United States Supreme Court can have this country take a turn that most people won't notice. Yeah, people don't know what the Chevron doctrine is. You can stop somebody on the street and say, hey, what's the Chevron doctrine? And unless they're a very particular kind of lawyer, they won't know. Uh, but what it is, is the doctrine that l lets America's regulatory agencies make the decisions where they have expertise. And it's really important when you're up against big industries that have a lot of experts to have experts against them who can call BS on them, who can call their bluffs, who understand the complexities and don't get fooled. And what these industries want to do is they want to shut down the regulatory piece of that and move so that they can make their arguments to courts, which are not expert, which are much more easily fooled, and which, if you pick the right judge, are on the side of the big industries now anyway, after all of the Federalist Society's work packing various courts. And one of the things we've grown accustomed to hearing uh, from the Republican judges on the Supreme Court is that Congress hasn't specifically authorized X or Y. Uh, Congress has very specifically authorized what is at issue here. Yeah, there is so much of the argument against the Chevron doctrine and against administrative regulations that is just complete hogwash. For instance, they say that it's completely unaccountable and therefore not part of our proper separation of powers. And yet the piece you just read from Justice Kavanaugh was him saying, actually, it changes every four to eight years, right? Responsive to the public. And Congress, we're, we, you know, our appropriations committees go over these agencies every single year. And we've got the Congressional Review Act to respond immediately if they get out of line. So they're super accountable. They're very responsive to the uh, political pressures that are around them, but they do it from a position of honesty and integrity and expertise. And that is what the polluting industries can't bear. It sounded like the Republican judges on the court were ready to get rid of this uh, principle completely. Well, it'll be interesting because they shot a major torpedo into the American regulatory system back in the West Virginia versus EPA case by creating something called the major questions doctrine. Remember, too big to fail? This is too big to regulate. That would have to go back to Congress. So this Chevron doctrine overlays with the major questions doctrine. And it wouldn't surprise me if they were a little bit chastened and hung back a little bit on taking too big of a bite out of the Chevron doctrine, A, because it's nonsense, and B, because they can do so much of the damage that their backers have put them out of the court to do using the major questions doctrine. They don't need to undo Chevron to do a lot of damage to the American regulatory system.